All righty. Hello and welcome to Creativity Conversations. I think this is episode six. And I have the brilliant, talented Wynn Morgan with me today. And yes, there's a pause in the background. And I'm just going to read Wynn's bio after, for those of you who haven't been on this call before, to just tell you a little bit about why I started doing them. And the reason for that is because I just got tired of hearing people say creativity is for artists or writers or, or uh, you know, creative types. And I wanted to disabuse people very kindly, of course, of that idea. So that being said, I'm going to read Wynn's bio and you'll get to see how he uses creativity in his world. So Wynn Morgan is a change agent based in Windsor, UK, and he works with corporations and private individuals in every continent around the world. Having started his own coaching and training business 14 years ago, Wynn has become sought after to develop leaders, teams, and organizations. He delivers dramatic step changes in business results by delivering a step change in people's thinking and understanding about their role, who they really are, and how they personally show up. A major part of his work is helping people to see that they're creative problem solvers and natural innovators by design, then helping them uncover this ability that we all have. So you can find out more about Wynn at www, are they still using that anymore? Winning with a Y dot co dot UK. So welcome, Monsieur. Nice to be here. Nice to have you here. So tell us a little bit about your background and why you think creativity is relevant in business in particular. Well, okay. Um, the second question is kind of like grabbed me now because I'm quite fascinated by that a lot more than the first one. So potted history. Um, after leaving university, I went into sales organizations for a few years. And a, one role that I kind of fell into was with PepsiCo, the Frito-Lay business, the snack food um, business in the UK, um, here in Great Britain. And I was based in my native South Wales. And the reason that I got the job, I kid you not, they were looking for someone with a degree with sales experience who could speak Welsh. <laughs> and I was the only one who applied that had those three things. So I got the job by default. Not bad. No, I know, it was pretty cool. Now they wanted someone to stay in that territory for two years doing that job. I lasted eight months before. Um, they noticed that I couldn't, I was a bit more than just those three boxes. So it was kind of nice to then notice. And then, um, then my progression within PepsiCo went really quickly. Um, and while I only stayed there, I think five years, I had six roles, each one mm -hmm. more advanced than the previous one. And here's what where I remember being quite funny. I remember at some point thinking that people were either analytical or creative, and it was one or the other, totally binary. And I thought I was analytical. And to help me develop, there was a, a training program that PepsiCo in the UK ran about creative thinking. And I went on this course for, I think it was about three days with some really senior people. I think I was by far the most junior people person on there, but I was always fighting to go on training courses. And I loved it, absolutely adored it. But then I, and we learned a process that would solve problems in business using creativity. And I fell in love with the process. I didn't realize then it wasn't the process that did anything. All the process did was free up narrow-mindedness. It just freed up all of this stuff. And I even remember to, to this day, um, the, the facilitator having writing up on the flip chart something called the problem pit. And when we're in the problem pit, all we see is the problem. And if you're looking to help with creative ideas, this problem owner solve it, don't be in the problem pit. But I didn't know that that was just 
human psychology working against itself that when all you see is the problem, you're not in a creative space. And then we'd have about 12 people as, um, what do they call them, naive resources who would just like throw ideas in from total left field all the time. And the more creative and disassociated they would be from the actual problem itself, the better, because it would springboard towards other creative ideas far, far away from the original problem owner's state of mind and their thinking. So there would be no space for staying in the problem pit. Now, it's funny because I was 27 when I went on that training course, which unfortunately is a long time ago for me. Right? It's, not, it's not half my age, right? But it's well over 20 years ago that I did that. And I can remember to this day realizing that I could be creative. What I now know is, as I hinted at a few minutes ago, that it wasn't about me and the process. It wasn't about the process. It was inherent in human beings that when they're not mentally tight, they can be created by nature. And if it's not us just attending to um, problematic thinking and being attached to small incremental steps or analytical thinking that opens up a whole other world of being inherently creative and it opens up it, it sounds to me as if you, you switch a channel on a tv set into creative but that's always possible fresh ideas and new thought is like it's it's totally our default so a bit of background with a little bit of mixing in on the creativity part there and after I left um, PepsiCo, I left PepsiCo in 1999, and I went to uh, an, a competitor of theirs in the similar industry in snack food and, and cookies, biscuits in the UK, as senior training manager, because I really wanted to get into training and people development. I thought that looked like so much fun. But I thought, is it fun? So I was offered a job. Um, I was approached and said, well, what job would you like? Oh, I'd love to run a training department within a company. And three months later, I was offered that and did that for a couple of years. And then in 01, I've been doing training and, uh, and, and coaching for companies since and private individuals. Own company, as you said in the bio, for 14 years, but now it's 20, 21 in developing people when you include the two years within the company. Um, and then... I've known more about the inherent innate ability for human beings to be creative and that's our nature. We are problem solvers by human nature. We are innovators by human nature. I've only really started to look at that in the last eight and start to understand that in the last eight years. But now it's beyond doubt. So when, how do you get people to see that, to recognize that, that they do have that natural ability? Because being in a problem pit sounds like Raiders of the Lost Ark and a lot of snakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of snakes. Oh, can you think about it? How do I get them? Well, I would let them to take a look. So in my mind, there's at least two ways people could see that. One way would be for them to see that human beings as a species are creative by nature. And I'd, I'd ask anyone here right now or listening to this is to take a look at the room that you're in and everything that you can see within the room, uh, or if you're outside and, and looking at a garden, everything that was planted in the garden, everything there came from human beings thinking. Everything there is being created by a human being. There was an idea and probably another idea and another idea. It's all humans doing that stuff. We're incredibly creative by nature. And if someone thinks, yeah, well, that's fine. Okay, for the person who invented the chair, they're creative. And whoever invented the internal combustion engine and, and the TV set and whoever invented Zoom and Facebook, oh, yeah, of course they're creative. And I mean, it's totally human. We, we think so many things all the time. And the fact that we think and the fact that we can put thought into, into being is one way that creativity shows up. 
whether that is a storyteller, whether that is problem solving, whether that is literally anything, making a cup of tea or making my coffee was a creative process, albeit that I've done it hundreds of times, but there's still some creation that goes in there. So if I were, process that takes place. sorry, if I were to play devil's advocate and pretend that I was an accountant or a CPA and all I did all day was crunch numbers, how could you point me in a direction that would say that that too is creative? Well, I, I might ask you, how do you decide which numbers to crunch? What makes you different from the next accountant? What's your client really looking for? Now, in my mind, all of those three questions would point to another thing as opposed to following the strict ABC process. And, and clients, because I know quite a few accountants, I also um, hire some for myself. So being creative, of course, within the law without bending rules, but being creative about how things actually work um, to make sound, to help give me sound advice and for me to grow my business, that's creative. Their ability to find me as a client is creative. Their ability to retain me as a client is creative. It's a human uh, interaction and it's a creative one. Now, of course, there are processes there that would be less creative, but I think it's the creation, the creativity part that, that makes accountant A different from accountant B. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is it's not in the it's not in the numbers. It's how the numbers are um, put together and what they say and how they're interpreted that is creative. So if I've got X number of things that I'm to adding, <laughs> so it's about my level at this point, then what you're saying is it's not just putting the numbers, adding the numbers so they add up correctly, but it, then what do I do with it? Yeah. How do I interpret the data? Interpretation is creative. Or another example would be, and I work a lot in, um, well, in organizations that are analytical. So data analysis, um, market research, agencies that are really good at providing um, data and insights, but, but the clients don't pay for data crunching because you can get any program to do that, any computer program to do that. But taking intelligent decisions and recommendations and insight from data is completely creative. I love that because it does, it just, it just changes the perspective on what's possible and, and, and opens up that definition of creativity. Yeah. So what's another word or two for creativity? Well, in my mind, something that was mentioned already today is problem solving. In my mind, problem solving problems is, is creation. We create solutions to problems. And going back to the second question that you asked me after the introduction, well, what role does creativity have within business? Well, business is a problem solving entity. That's what businesses does, right? It solves problems. Sometimes it creates them too, but, but really it's about solving problems. Well, that takes creativity. And it's an underrated kind of resource that we have often in ourselves because I don't think it's that respected or talked about in that way. But the number of times that I've been asked over the last dozen odd, you know, pushing 20 odd years, can you run creative thinking training for us? Can, what are you, where are you stuck 
oh, we just don't know that we are, you know, we just, we're way too uh, logical, we're way too this and we're way too that. But, but it doesn't take much for people just to wake up to the fact that they can be creative. So as an example, I remember when I was first um, in a training company. So this is the job that I joined back in 2001 after I left being the training manager. So as a training consultant and I was being trained in the material of creative thinking. And the first thing that they did was, okay, so here's what we do to get people's mind out of where they're at. We take something like a paper clip and we get them to brainstorm 150 things you can do with a paper clip. I said, oh, lovely, great idea. Why do you do that? Uh, yeah, why do we do that? Oh, it, just to break whatever they're thinking in the moment. Oh, okay, so literally, and what do you do after that? Oh, we just then go and help them solve stuff. Oh, okay, so the paper clip thing literally is just getting people out of their heads. Yes, awesome end of. So then they just show up as their free thinking selves that they all were, we all were as kids, where everything was play. Everything was imagination in, in, in real time taking form. Well, that same ability is what businesses have always needed and always will, is the ability to create. Because any business that is sitting on yesterday's best idea will quickly get swallowed up and i've seen it happen so many times where here's a quick example there's an owner operated business that i did some work with in central europe and it's a startup and, th and this person literally had an idea out of the blue for a product and it grew and grew and grew and it was a game changer in that industry and I think there's about 130 people working in the company, did really well, but the owner only had one idea. And while it went through various iterations of incremental improvements, it soon became null and void. It was yesterday's news, totally yesterday's news. It would be, I guess, uh, today's version of cassette player or an eight track or an eight track yeah that even predates me so <laughs> yeah it's all of that stuff and and other organizations and i remember another organization here in the uk where again owner operated and had a product was doing through the iterations but also would always go back to what's next how does this industry, how might this industry evolve in three years time? What may be the needs? And now let's just have 12 people in our lab, which was a meeting room, or they call it a lab because they could mind experiment and create in there and, and go in there for a day and a half. And it was amazing what would come out. And I remember being going in there because sometimes they would get stuck because it would sometimes get personal and snipey and everything. But, it was just always such a wonderful joy to be in there to witness something new that would be a game changer and completely disruptive to a marketplace. And this one idea that, that they've been working on for the last 15 months now, that when that comes out will change, in my mind, or could, has the potential to change energy storage for, for the next generation. It's just glorious. That's so cool. It is. So do you think that, you know, a lot of the, the techniques and strategies that are out there have a lot to do with making a distinction between right brain and left brain and putting things into compartments? Because I have read that second only to working on the cloud, creativity is the most important quality that any business can have. But I don't think people know what that means. And I think it gets bogged down. So I, I may have said this to you, but one of my favorite quotes, and I've probably said it on here before, is from Steve Chandler, who quoted Steve uh, Hardison when Steve was, the first Steve was complaining about some problem he had. And Steve Hardison said, 
Well, given the situation as you described it, what would you like to create? Totally took the emphasis off being a victim to this powerful pro problem and turning it so that the power, if you will, the, the resources were coming from the individual. But I just hear so much, oh, well, I need to get out of my left brain into my right brain. And it just seems like we complicate the process way, way unnecessarily. I would agree. And, and anything that complicates the process can't be a good idea. I mean, I mean, how do we conceptualize it to be left brain versus right brain? I mean, it makes no sense to me. But what I do know is the whole brain is a wonderful vessel for the mind to do a very imaginative stuff. I don't care which hemisphere or which part of the brain it is. I know that we as humans have the ability to think new, fresh all the time when we're not closing us innocently often, closing ourselves down to thinking of the problem, thinking of the past, being risk averse. Um, and also the other thing that I hear a lot about in businesses is the use of best practice. And while best practice sounds like a really neat idea, the only thing it ever gets is to everyone to yesterday's best idea. There's no future in the best practice. It's all yesterday. It's all stale. And, and while that can be fine for a short time period, it is, it's always treading water. There's no new stuff there. Nothing new. I think people forget that. They want to rely on something that has worked in the past and put out of their toolbox. People are so fond of having a toolbox and saying, well, this has worked. Let's do this now. Do you I see that a lot? Yeah, heaps. I've got an example here. I remember going into a company about five years ago. They invited me in, um, a very large company. And the UK division had been doing pretty well. And I knew the business quite well because I'd coached people there for quite a while. But the head of um, enablement, learning and development, he and I had a meeting and he said, the issue that we've got is that we've become so risk averse and I can see it's having, it's really limiting us. Can you help? And I said, yeah, but I need to understand a lot more first. But literally they would be at the behest of shareholder value in the next quarter above everything else. So here we are, as, we, as you and I are talking right now live, it's early July 2020. So quarter three of the calendar year has just started within businesses right now. Literally, their focus would be, how do we make sure that in the next three months, in July, August, and September, we do well enough in order for the corporate head office, global head office, to not take money away from us in 2021? That's how they were operating. Now, in, in my mind, and while it might have some merits, if there is shareholder, um, the major shareholders have some nervousness about the business, but often they didn't. Often they, the, the shareholders would say, well, you know, you, you're doing the same old thing every year, year in, year out. And while it might be good for our returns in a small, uh, a small market, we'd love you to be a bit more aggressive on tearing up the old. But literally, if the only thing businesses did was just look after the next three months' results, they will tread water on, let's have iterative improvements on the previous three months. Or the, or the equivalent three months from last year, because that's what the lapping in the revenue numbers. But that doesn't do anything. That doesn't shake the tree. So it what certainly I, doesn't grow new ones. <laughs> sorry, Liz. Sorry. Well, no, it, it's just um, that that pretty much dovetails into my next question, which is what gets in the way. And one of the things I hear you saying is, aside from, in addition to looking backwards at what has worked, is, is having a, a time frame 
a time limit on this has to work within this period of time or else. Mm -hmm. So what else do you see as, as uh, things that really squash creativity? Panic, insecurity. Um, those are true things because I just had a, another memory of a of the head of a of an ad agency, global agency, and they wanted to do things differently and really wanted to grow ahead of where they'd been growing up until now. They wanted to regain share compared to other kind of smaller agencies that had been really snapping at their heels, and they'd noticed the reason why they weren't doing it was because they weren't spending time with clients and they were always in the, the kind of like iterative retread of their products and services that they that it offer. And that had been incredibly successful and still were, but if they wanted to get double digit growth again, that wasn't going to do it. They had to do something different. And literally I, I was there having had two and a half days with, very senior people from different parts of the organization in different parts of the world. And the last half day was right. So now we've thought about what's going to really help us get out of our heads and get all of our people to be far more client centric and far more right. Let's innovate. Let's really get in those relationships and understand what clients are looking for more deeply. And the question became in that last half a day, what might get in our way? And the external guy, me, because he could, had the guts to say, what's the CEO going to say if the first four months it doesn't go well? Oh, it won't take that long. What do you mean? It won't take that long for the panic button to be pressed and saying, no, 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 let's go back to getting the forecast right. Really? Yeah, well, until that changes, you're going to be exactly where we are. And someone's job in here maybe maybe more than one and i'd probably suggest it would be more than one needs to talk to the ceo to actually get some slack in order to try some new things because the resistance to actually uh, the short-term mentality of hitting a, a, a target is what holding you back and until that's broken innovation new thinking and new ideas ain't gonna go anywhere and in fact, will be damaging in the medium long term because you'll have people trying it and then noticing it didn't work because it takes longer than a few weeks for something to actually get traction. They're going to give up. They're going to say creativity is a bad idea. Or they'll leave because they think it is a good idea, but, they, but they're quashed here. And they, the whole room went quiet and said, glad he said that, not me. Right, who's it going to be? <laughs> I remember one guy said, I can do that. I'm new. I got no extra wine. I'm, I'm new. And he was probably the second senior person in that room. He said, oh, I can do that. But I need a couple of other people with more experience to come with me. So to answer your question, what gets in the way is we get so tied up in results and outcome and getting the right thing that it, it makes new ideas the currency of risk as opposed to the currency of, re of reward. Well put. Hmm. And I think that goes back to your point about fear. When people are fear driven, they're going to be as conservative as they possibly can. Yeah. Yeah. Fear really can. And I don't mean always, but I think it really can make the creative part of the, of the mind just close down an awful lot more. Yeah. So there are two things that I want to talk about uh, at some point in our conversation. And then um, op and at some point, like now, we can open it up to whoever else is on the call. But I want to talk about um, to how you see uh, the value of creativity for entrepreneurs. You've had your own business for a good long time now. And also just to talk about how you see creativity 
or vision or possibility, whatever it is we're talking about here, um, as important in, everybody likes to use the word pivot now yeah. because of the pandemic and how everything is online now and everybody has to shift gears in order to continue to do well. So I wanna add that to the mix because I know a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of women entrepreneurs that I work with who are like, what do I do? How do I adjust? You know, and, and then there, and there are loads of things out there now that have techniques and tools that still seem to be rooted in the past and things that are useful to do based on what they, what was done in the past, but we're looking at really new territory. The final thing that you said, I think is a lovely thing to note is so the question, what do I do? It can be asked in our own heads about what do I do? Or it can be, what do I do? One of them is from a place of, as you said, fear. And the other one is from a place of expansion of, I wonder what might occur. And we are equally able to do either of those two things, although sometimes we think we are more habitually uh, set one way, but it doesn't mean that we are biologically that way or DNA that one way. It's just a habitual, sometimes we are more prone to doing one or the other. But I would suggest that when it comes to what do I do given what's happening or what has happened, the wonder, the expansiveness is something to really notice. And if all anyone's listening to this does is notice the feeling of the expansiveness of wondering about what I can do. Wonder, I wonder. Notice the expansiveness of that and the feeling within that. Well, they're on an innovation curve. That's a creative process being started by that question. And not knowing what to do is always the start. Because if you already knew what to do, then there would be no creativity there. You just do what you know to do. So not knowing is in fact quite a gift that doesn't always look like one. I remember talking to someone recently and they said to me, well, I don't know what to do. And I went, well, what always happens before you know what to do? I don't know what to do. Yeah, that's all this is. I don't know always comes before I know. Fact. It's like night before day. Oh, yeah. So it's nothing to be feared, even though sometimes it can be. The other point regarding pivoting and in, and in my business, yeah. So literally over one week in March, my entire business model, of which more than, more than half of my time had been spent away from the United Kingdom doing international work, which literally was face-to-face -face training workshops and face-to-face -face, uh, long-term coaching sessions with people, multi-day. Well, lo and behold, uh, even the UK offices were closed. No one was working in offices anymore. Everyone was staying home. And all of my international work, of course, had changed. And it wasn't happening. And I literally my uh, three months of April, May, June all got canceled. All my corporate work got canceled over the space of three days in March for very good reasons. They weren't things that could easily then be switched into, into virtual. And the reason was, even if they could have been, the reason that they weren't switched into doing them all virtual over um, on screens was because they were more long-term and that's not what they needed right now. They needed to find a way of actually working effectively today, not thinking about 2022, which is what that work was for them. So I was left with a big hole in my revenue and a little bit of a worried face. And um, I was able to put that off for quite a while because I, I, I was really busy that one week where it all happened. and. Then the weekend came and I went, oh, I've got to start facing this now. And me and some, some colleagues and friends got together on a Monday and we just played around with various things that we were all stuck in. And literally at some point by the Wednesday, it was 
obvious to me what I needed to do and how I could help. It just, oh, what people need right now in businesses is are these couple of things. Which was funny because as soon as I realized that, I didn't do anything about it, but I had inquiries coming in about that exact thing. I kid you not. I had one program that kept me busy for the following four weeks. Global, without moving from this chair, I covered 138 people in one company that helped them be more emotionally resilient while their customer base were panicking. Brand new thing. But it was kind of obvious to me that, oh, resilience is what people need to do now is, and understanding that external factors do not impact them emotionally and they can be as emotionally creative, strong, resilient as in nothing to do with external circumstances. And they lapped it up and it was an awesome, awesome time. The other thing that I realized as well is that what I'm seeing about businesses today is really clear in the way people are leading from a distance, managing people. Some are taking an awful lot more care of their people and some they're trying to care more, but in fact it comes across as micromanagement or mistrust because the leader is responding to their own panic and insecurity and, and everything. Well, I know from talking to a few of those businesses whose leaders are going into the, the panic and insecurity that one of those businesses is going to close this year because literally of that, nothing else. Because they've asked their C-suite to actually, in their country, um, break social distancing and, and, and break the... Uh, the guidelines of the government in that country and that's here in Europe and the C-suite people said we ain't doing that that's just like why would you do that that's just like not on so the leaders are leaving another company that I'm thinking of right now is a second line manager had more time to talk with the, the two levels below and in that effectively made them all really self-conscious by the interaction that this senior leader had. I know half of them are set to leave as soon as they can. As soon as the employee market opens up and, and some already have handed in the notice because I think, well, this just isn't worth it. If this is what they, how they treat me, I'm done. I'm done. And the good people are leaving first, of course, because they can find work elsewhere really easily. And there are few, and there's so many other businesses that I know are in that space too, because I just hear so many rumors about them. But I can see me being able to help. So there's a few companies more recently that I've been talking to them about another company in North America um, that I've been helping their leaders get more of a sense of the distance, the distance between acting between uh, insecurity and trusting and generally caring about the well-being of their staff members. Totally eye-opening. That product didn't exist a month ago. It's that brilliant. just from creation by listening. And the other thing, because of how much, frankly, money it takes to fly me in other parts around the world, and then for hotels and venues and so forth, so therefore, only certain people of a certain seniority and salary, it would make economic sense for them to, to have me there in person. Well, now it's all virtual. There's this whole two layers down that can be reached because the price is half as much because they don't have to charge all the other stuff, all the travel and, and venue costs. Yeah. So meanwhile, the potential for my business, heaps of new products, heaps of new people all from the comfort of this chair. And okay, sometimes I start work at 2 a.m. local time. Yeah, but, but if I was in Australia or New Zealand, I'd have flown there, be already tired, and be at that time of day anyway. So what? <laughs> yeah. I don't mind being in your time zone while I'm in my house. That's fine. There is such a thing as caffeinated coffee. It serves me well. <laughs> I can imagine it does. <laughs> I'm going to open this up to anyone who has a question that's on the call and just unmute yourself and ask away. 
Yo, some friendly faces here. Nice to see you. Hi. Carrie, go ahead. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. You know, I've loved this whole conversation because I, 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 I love the distinction. I, I, I realized I was making a distinction that I, that was an assumption. I was, I was assuming things about creativity. Uh, and I, I, I love the definition of just, it's, it's just bringing something into being. And, and we do that in the course of the day. I love the, you know, talking about tea as a cup of tea as a creation. Well, then everything's a creation and then creating can't be that difficult because we're always doing crap, you know? So it, it, it takes it out of the realm of this um, really kind of elusive esoteric process that only a few people have access to. And I really like that. The, just the sheer accessibility of it is terrific. Yeah. So I didn't really have a question, but I just wanted to share that because I, I, I love that. Cool. Anything that demystifies something that isn't mystic, that isn't mystic to begin with, is is cool. Or it's mystic, yet we're all made of it. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh yeah. Well, I do mysticism all the time then. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Reminds me of the Van Morrison song "Into the Mystic." <laughs> <laughs> I might have to look that one up now. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> you know, one of the things. Um, I've learned from making art is that someday when uh, TEDx talks come back into being, I'd, I'd love to do one on this subject because there are so many things that are, that for me I've experienced in the creative process um, that are relevant to the workplace. And I remember distinctly I may have said this at another time, but I was working on a piece, an abstract piece, which I, I didn't really like and I couldn't really get anywhere with it. And I was in a, taking a class and the, the, the instructor came over and I said, you know, I don't really like this very much. And she said, hmm, I wonder, those words again. And she took a piece of paper that I had collaged on, she started to peel it off. And I was shocked. I was like, what are you doing? And when she did that, I suddenly realized, oh, that was one of those, what if I just, you know, did this? And it opened up this whole other possibility in the piece that I was making. And it just showed me how going into something without, um, with being just completely open, like, what if, what if I do this? What if I wreck it? What if it looks like I'm wrecking it? That's not the end. And one of my, my favorite quotes, which I don't know where it came from, was um, everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Yeah. And I've seen that quote being attributed to John Lennon and somebody else. So I don't know the true origin of it. But it's, it's lovely though, isn't it? It's just that being willing to go into something, A, as you said, not knowing, because that is the beginning of everything and being willing to have it appear however it's going to appear in that moment, because it's not the end. There's always more to it. Lovely. Hi. Um, hi, Dan. Hi. 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 This was a, a delight. Uh, I just happened to, to see Nina's post and I thought I'll tune in. But, um, Oh, I just wanted to share, you know, an insight that I had and I was actually taking some notes um, because I've, you know, I've kind of known create creativity is natural. And, but then I was also kind of holding a belief that there's something to do to be creative. And I guess the insight that came to me was that, you know, when you were talking about how that's naturally the way we are. and that um, it's only in my limitations, you know, in, in, in the fear or whatever that, uh, that I kind of close that off. So if there's anything to do, it's just sort of noticing where I'm stopping the flow uh, or where I'm limiting myself. So that was, that was very cool. It, it like lightens up a little bit the whole, the whole thing. So uh, very brilliant. much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Dan. That's a wonderful insight. Yeah. 
wonderful insight. Yeah. So, when do you think that creativity is? This may be an obvious question, but do you think that creativity is sourced in insight? Seeing something fresh? The possibility of seeing something fresh. Yeah. Not necessarily a prerequisite of insight because I think it opens the door for insight to happen and it could be an insight that would be if you think it depends on the definition of an insight but if an insight is new fresh thought yeah then that would be in the same realm as creativity but again knowing that new fresh thought is is a part of our absolute nature even if it even if it looks like that isn't creativity because it you know we we imagine and catastrophize and uh, and whatever else we might do in our mind but the fact that we're able to feel bad over something that isn't happening right now is creative Say more about that, because that sounds a little wonky to maybe people who are not familiar yeah. with your background Wonkiness. and your point of view. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, well, earlier this morning, I was talking to somebody, um, a client who I'd known for a long time, but we've only started um, she's only started working with me recently and in our session this morning she's able to make up stories about what other people think at work and in those stories she then decides not to say what she thinks she's created a story that doesn't exist because no one said anything and then has acted on a story that she's imagined and made up. Well, everything in that is creative. No, I'd rather her, and so would she, rather make up something different, but that's creative. That's creativity. That's creativity. Every time we dream, even if it's a nightmare, creativity. Every time we, so let, let's say, uh, Let's say someone has a phobia of flying, who's probably loving lockdown, right? But someone has a phobia of flying. Well, when are they afraid of flying? Well, before they get on the plane. So before they get on the plane. So they're making up, they're having the experience of being afraid of flying while they're not flying. That's creative. Because it's making something up that isn't there. We do that all the time about everything, but we don't know it. And then we think, oh, no, I can't do anything creative. Well, we're living in a, a created world and we're creating all the time, but we just don't see it that way. Do you think there's a difference between creativity and imagination? No. I think they're from the same realm. I think um, creating a thing isn't the same as imagination, but it has to start with it. The spark, the initial spark is imagination. But if you can, what's the, there's a phrase or something, if you can, if you can dream it, it can happen or something. Yeah. Well, that would be our imagination or our innate ability to be a creative of mind. And, our, and then the ability that we have as human beings to actually put what we imagine into being. At some point, I, I would imagine it, it wasn't. I don't know if the first wheel was ever an iterative process from we have this square piece of stone, let's roll it. And therefore it started to get worn and then it was round. I don't know, maybe they saw something round and think, wait a minute, I can use that. <laughs> I wonder where else. Or it can like anything. 
Well, I, I remember one of my favorite examples of imagination. Um, the two come to mind. Einstein used to do thought experiments. So he used to actually imagine traveling along a photon. I, I don't even know if the word photon existed then, but um, he was imagining himself traveling on a beam of light in order for him to understand more about the nature of light and how it works. The, um, the person who invented the electronic version of the TV, so not Joan Loggy Baird, who was more about valves and so forth, but the electronic version of the TV, was staring in a plowed field and then noticed, oh, that's a metaphor for, for making the electronic TV set actually work. And I can't remember the next link, but it was just like, boom. Imagination of plowed field, therefore with an electronic current around it, can then disturb it in a way where a picture would appear on the screen. I think that's phenomenal. Yeah. That's an imagination. J.K. Rowling sat in a cafe in Edinburgh and had thoughts, oh, seven books. Oh, this could work. <laughs> and we think they're the exception to us. Yeah. Nope, they're identical to us. They just got a different flavor of creativity in the same way as yours is art. And um, mine is whatever I do. I don't know if it's got a definition to it, but just living creatively. Doesn't matter how it shows up and what our flavor of creativity is, but we are all inherently that way. Do you think that creativity can be cultivated beyond beyond noticing, which I totally agree with you is the the cornerstone? I think the culture of creativity in an organization can be cultivated. So if I think back to the organization I was, I was mentioning to you uh, a few minutes ago about that company who become very risk averse, I think they could change their culture to become far more creative and cultivate that culture by having less reward and attention on results and more on ideas. That would be one way you could cultivate that. less attention on success and more attention on something else and i don't know what that would be i'd need to think more about that yeah so if you've got here's here's a here's a scenario if you've got a company that is trying to stay current with what's going on in the world and and part of your team is reluctant to try new things or to try things that are uncomfortable for them or they're just not familiar with it and they don't want to go there how would you address that i'd want to understand a few things what it is about the status quo that seems more comfortable than breaking it than something different and I'd also want to understand what it is about that, that comfort that you just mentioned. Um, what do they understand about comfort? Because I think they don't understand comfort. I'd think that, but I'd want to really poke around in that to, to figure that out. And, and what is it about the way that they see their business and their world and their life, frankly, that makes the way of working right now make sense for them? Yeah, because there'll be a model of the world that they possibly don't even know that they have, but they're responding to that right now. Yeah, and there'll be false premises, false assumptions that are in that model of the world that they have that they might see that if they notice that it was made up of nothing, that they are then free to think totally differently example would be if they knew that their um their being okay with life had nothing to do with the next quarter's results they may show up differently to to work they may show up differently to all kinds of things if they knew for example that 
the feeling of fear, the feeling of being restricted, the feeling of, I wonder, I don't know, is totally different from I wonder. And if they've just got a sense of their mind being closed down as a signal that they're in their head as opposed to in the world, then all of a sudden they could be, have a totally different way of being. And they may be open to, to share ideas, to have fresh ideas come into their mind and communicate with their peers, their work and themselves in a whole new way. So I just want to poke a little bit more into this word comfort. Yeah. Because you, you, you singled that out. And what, what you see is, that to me, that just sounds like a huge block to even being remotely creative, remotely able to do things that no man has done before. So I'd love your take on that, because that really seems to me what would, in addition to the insecurity, uh, wanting comfort, seeking comfort, to stay in the comfort zone is a real creativity killer yeah and in my mind there there is that way of looking at it which looks really true to me but i'm not convinced it's wholly true because i remember a phrase years ago learning that necessity is the mother of invention and necessity is the opposite of well one way of saying necessity is the opposite of comfort like we need to do something therefore we must and therefore we must it's totally compelling to follow that but i don't know because I remember being very comfortable while being creative. I remember being not comfortable, but also with a tingly excitement while I'm thinking something new. Yeah. I don't necessarily think that comfort is the enemy of it. Um, but having too much respect for how we feel is. I would say that I would go as far as to say if I if I'm concerned about how I feel, then I'm more likely to not uh, innovate and to not be more creative because I'm just going to be living in a narrow way. Now you now that might sound like comfort, yeah, it, it may be, but again, it's how we define the word. Yeah, it's familiar. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's an interesting. Um way to look at it because on one hand you can see how people don't want to be they don't want to have scary uncomfortable feelings on the other hand the idea of following the feeling that feels light and positive and has that tingly energy that you mentioned that's very appealing mm. very appealing indeed i mean there isn't anyone that doesn't like the sound of that, the tingly yeah. feeling. So following feelings seems to be somewhat, it depends what feelings you're following. Yeah. So another way of saying it would be, huh, misunderstanding feelings. So an example would be, I could be tingly with a new idea or I could be, I don't know, confused with a new idea or I could be in a problem pit with a new idea. It could be lots of different things that are going on there. But, but if I'm paying less attention to how I feel in the moment or my emotions, if I'm paying less attention and respect to my emotions right now, I am free, free to do anything. I'm being free to, or the feeling I'm free to do anything is a wonderful place to therefore express in any way possible, including being completely tearing up the old and into the new. And, and if I know that my feelings do not come from stuff, doing things, not doing things, if I know that that's a different world, a different universe, and if I know that outcomes good, bad, indifferent, aren't the source of me being okay, I'm totally free to experiment. You know what I'm talking about? Right in front of the table, like between the pool and the table and the crack there in the yeah. front. Yeah. 
It might be worthwhile Thank trying to loot. Thank you. What's your magic potion? I forgot. Did I write it on there? Oops. Vinegar and water. Let's see if that worked. Looks like it did. Looks like yeah, it. that worked. Okay. So I think what that point of of freedom, inner freedom, that comes from recognizing that we don't have to be slaves to our emotions yeah. when they they look scary to us is another component which really fosters the creative process. Yes, that's how I wish I could have said it. <laughs> <laughs> As I was in my own creation of trying to figure out the words that would make sense, <laughs> in comes Nina with a slam dunk of being able to actually summarize it beautifully. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I meant to say. Glad I could summarize it for you. <laughs> if we don't have any other questions, I am going to um, wrap this up. And it's always a pleasure, Lynn, wi Lynn Wynn, talking with Both you yeah. again. And just remind us where we can find you and what you're up to. You can find me at my office for the foreseeable future, not so much on a plane or on Heathrow Airport. Um, you can find me at, or my email is win, which is w-y-n at winning.co.uk, which is w-y-n-n-i-n-g, so winning the word with a y, dot co.uk, so win at winning.co.uk. Or I'm easy to find on LinkedIn, on Facebook. If you're friends with Nina, if you look up mutual friends, my face will be there, albeit a slightly slower version than the one I have right now. <laughs> I love the one you have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been a delight, Nina. Always fun to speak with you. You too. Take care, everyone. Lovely to see you, Gary, Dan, Yvonne. Take care. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Great. Great conversation. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.